Listen to a lecture on biology. If I asked you what sets humans apart from the rest of creation, what would you say? Um, probably something about complex communication, right? We know that primates, birds, and dolphins can also communicate on a basic level. But did you know that other life forms, like plants and even bacteria, can communicate as well? So what I want to talk about today is bacteria communication. You'll all be interested to know that it was actually a student who was the first to realize this. Back in the 60s, a microbiologist and one of his students were studying these bacteria called Vibrio fischeri. Um, if you've ever been in a tropical ocean at night and seen luminescence in the water, then you've seen Vibrio fischeri. They're able to light themselves up. The student, Ken Nielsen was his name, did his own research and determined that the bacteria only light up once their local population has reached a certain size. What happens is something called quorum sensing. Um, a quorum is the number of people you need at a meeting to take a vote. So each of these little individual bacteria sends out a signal, a special molecule called an autoinducer, to sort of say, "Hello, I'm here." If enough bacteria are gathered in one place saying, "I'm here," and there are lots of these autoinducer molecules swimming around. Eventually, by detecting these autoinducers, the bacteria can work together to trigger a certain phenomenon. Now, Vibrio fischeri, the bioluminescent bacteria I mentioned earlier, don't make any light until they have detected a large enough number of other bacteria through quorum sensing. Why waste the energy? But suddenly, when enough bacteria are present, all of them will light up together. As another example, let's talk about the bacteria that make us sick. If there were just a few of them releasing toxins, your immune system would wipe them out just like that. But now, if there were thousands or even millions of these bacteria all ganging up together, waiting, quorum sensing, and spitting out their autoinducers, then bam! They detect enough autoinducers and all decide to release their toxins at once. Your immune system is overwhelmed. It can't immediately fight back against so many toxins, so you get an infection that takes several days to go away. You can see why quorum sensing is effective, right? Nielsen's research didn't really have much credibility until about ten years ago, so this is a very new field of study. Scientists still don't know how some bacteria are able to light up, or how many bacteria exactly are needed to make a quorum that triggers an event. But now that we found out how important this bacterial communication is in causing sicknesses and infections, it's being studied in much more detail. If there's some way we can block this quorum sensing from happening, and you know there are certain species of bacteria that can actually do this. Kind of like microscopic computer hacking. If we can learn how to hack the bacteria communication system, then we can prevent lots of medical conditions. As you can imagine, medical research departments are starting to devote significant resources to this goal. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Twenty-three. What does the professor mainly discuss? Twenty-four. What does the professor say about Ken Nielsen? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. What happens is something called quorum sensing. Um, 
A quorum is the number of people you need at a meeting to take a vote. So each of these little individual bacteria sends out a signal, a special molecule called an autoinducer, to sort of say, "Hello, I'm here." Twenty-five. Why does the professor say this? Um, a quorum is the number of people you need at a meeting to take a vote. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, Vibrio fischeri, the bioluminescent bacteria I mentioned earlier, don't make any light until they have detected a large enough number of other bacteria through quorum sensing. Why waste the energy? But suddenly, when enough bacteria are present, all of them will light up together. Twenty-six. What does the professor imply when he says this? Why waste the energy? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Then, bam! They detect enough autoinducers and all decide to release their toxins at once. Your immune system is overwhelmed; it can't immediately fight back against so many toxins. So you get an infection that takes several days to go away. You can see why quorum sensing is effective, right? Twenty-seven. What does the professor mean when he says this? You can see why quorum sensing is effective, right? Twenty-eight. Why does the professor mention computer hacking? Listen to a lecture on geography. The professor is discussing lakes of the Rub Al Khali. To continue our ongoing discussion of desert geography, um, I'd like to spend some time today talking about a giant patch of desert on the Arabian Peninsula. It covers a quarter of it, in fact. It's known as the Rub Al Khali, which is usually translated as the empty quarter in English. It's an apt translation because the place is almost completely barren. There are very few plants and animals, and certainly no people. But、uh, that wasn't always the case. Seeing as there's lots of geological evidence pointing to lakes and grasslands teeming with life from long ago, scientists figure, rather they speculate. It's hard to say for sure. That monsoon rains, the ones we see in Egypt and India nowadays, had shifted a couple of times to pour rain in the Arabian desert. The first monsoon happened around thirty-seven thousand years ago, and the second one more recently, like ten thousand years ago. These two monsoons caused desert lakes to form. It's clear that heavy rain was necessary, but another condition was needed for this to happen. There had to be some clay or silt present. If there were only sand, the water would filter down and not remain standing, but the other materials would stop it from seeping away. So the geological record points to there having been two distinct sets of lakes in the area. The older lakes appear to have been formed in the valleys between the giant sand dunes running through the empty quarter. These lakes tended to be quite long. 
Some of them were a kilometer in length, and they likely lasted for several years before they evaporated. The newer lakes, the 10,000-year-old ones, were much smaller, so they probably didn't exist for very long. Like I mentioned before, the older 37,000-year-old lakes were long and thin, almost finger-like. This is because the sand dunes themselves were long and rounded, so the water would run down them, taking the clay with it, and sit in the long gaps between the dunes. In the period between the monsoons, scientists guess that some sort of climate change occurred. There must have been hotter, drier conditions, which brought heavy winds along to reshape the sand dunes and to make them choppier and more abrupt, giving them a crested shape like they have today instead of a smooth, rounded one. Scientists assume that the rainwater started to pool and form lake beds on these newly shaped dunes. Another point I want to discuss is the fossils found near each set of lakes. With the lakes, conditions suddenly became livable and animals started to migrate over, which was a mistake because the lakes only lasted a short time. In the older lakes, fossils of large animals such as water buffalo and hippopotamus were found. In the newer lakes, however, only fossils of smaller animals were discovered, which gives you an idea of how shallow the newer ones probably were in comparison. Both types of lakes were apparently very salty as well, if mineral deposits are any indication. The fossil record backs this up. We can find snail and clam shells in abundance there, but fossilized remains of fish. Since the lakes were not fed by a freshwater source, they became saltier and saltier, and such conditions are uninhabitable to fish. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 29. What is the professor mainly discussing? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Scientists figure, rather they speculate, it's hard to say for sure, the monsoon rains, the ones we see in Egypt and India nowadays, had shifted a couple of times to pour rain in the Arabian desert. 30. What can be inferred about the monsoon rains? Thirty-one. According to the professor, why was clay or silt necessary to form the lakes? Thirty-two. According to the professor, what are two characteristics of the older lakes? Thirty-three. What is the professor's opinion on animal migration to the lake? Thirty-four. 
According to the professor, what is the evidence that the lakes were very salty?